It occurs to me that I have not yet discussed the Clive. This is a terrible mistake, to talk about who I am and things that have affected me, especially mentors. To leave the Clive out would be like leaving out a base foundation for a building. You see, the Clive entered my life in my teenage years and left me in my twenties a changed person with a different outlook and a belief in understanding other people that a pretty inward-reflected kid would have never seen. So, let's talk about The Clive. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It, a podcast about technology, history, and getting myself out of debt. Thanks to Daniel Boyd, Jeff Atwood, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. I call him the Clive because his son called him the Clive. I'll talk about his son some other time, but he was a high school friend, and he had a sort of deep abiding respect and fear about his father, Clive, and when you're a teenager and you meet the parents of your friends, you have a habit of treating them kind of like blank slates, like they were people of some sort before you met them, but not much happened. Occasionally, you see evidence of a life lived before the children came into it, but often you don't. The parents are just the parents. They meet you, they see that you're a friend of their children, and that you share different interests with them, and then the parents step out of the spotlight and let you two have your day. In the case of the Clive, I simply knew him as my friend's father, but he didn't have many conversations with me, and I certainly didn't understand what his job was or what he did. As I graduated from high school, and my friend stayed my friend, I learned more about the Clive because he would discuss potential work with me, things that I might do, some sort of projects that he was involved in, and maybe giving him a hand, especially in technical matters. In what I'm going to say is one of the great understatements of my life, the Clive was a salesman. But he was a salesman who wasn't just focused on whatever product he was selling. He was an all-around force, possessing a superhuman ability to size up situations, to learn information towards how he was going to sell things, to who he was going to sell it, and what phrases and classifications would work best with potential customers. As I got into Unix administration in my 20s, the Clive and I would have occasional discussions on the phone where he had different work he might ask me to do. And as we talked, I fell under his spell. The Clive was English, and his accent added a bit of gravitas to whatever he was saying. But it was the words themselves, the situations he would present, and how he would look at them that really knocked me on my head. One of the magic aspects of the Sherlock Holmes stories is how Sherlock Holmes sees everything a little bit different than everyone else, how he would analyze evidence and statements by people, combining it with strengths in memory and logic to produce answers that nobody else could have even dreamt of coming to. In the case of the Clive, there were a few times when I called upon him to help friends of mine while they were working on something or interviewing for a job. I bring these up first because they really demonstrated his way of thinking. I put him on a conference call with one friend who was doing interviews with a potential employer and let the Clive pepper him with questions. His questions were not, how do you feel about your answers? They weren't about, what chances do you think you have? It was, where were people looking? Was there an individual that everybody else would glance at? 
How were people seated around the table? Was there someone at the head of it? Was there someone who seemed more relaxed than the others? What he was trying to do was figure out the power structure of the interviewers, such that my friend could then aim all of his work in the future towards convincing that person he was the one for the job, to keep the others informed, but to keep that person impressed. The Clive understood body language like an inherent natural expression. He could tell when people were questioning his answers. He could tell when somebody wasn't really going to have the final decision. And he would utilize friendly conversations he would have with other members of clients and companies to essentially recruit spies, recruit somebody who could tell him how things were going. He could turn on charm like a waterfall, and he could hold back information like a vault. When he was working with various clients that were long-term, in one case, decades, he would always keep an eye out for different people working at that client company who might want to make his account, the Clive's account, redundant. Like a set of strategies worthy of Sun Tzu, the Clive would isolate that person or bring up conversations that they weren't privy to to have information that they couldn't use against him. He would take the right people out to lunch. He would provide favors outside of the standard vendor-client relationship to ensure he had allegiances that would warn him of incoming and possibly fatal customer relations. In this way, he tenaciously held on to one contract for over 20 years, feeding his family with it, while also setting up contingency plans along every different line, both at that client and other potential ones. He brought me in a couple times. I worked for a few companies where <laughs> shiny and new, wearing a tie and a jacket that made me sweat, I would apply my skills to make their systems work again if a mirror had failed or restore items from backup and otherwise document and provide them with the tools they needed to be able to make next steps. Under his tutelage, I learned how to look at people, how to ask the right questions without seeming ignorant, how to face people properly, how to enter a room. While all of these seem like tangential at best, it was through this way of looking at things that I realized how much of life is a dance, a dance of first impressions and last words, of people thinking about you after you're gone, or maybe preferably never thinking of you again after you're gone, knowing on a moment what your next steps should be. Should the wrong words come out? Should the project take a turn, face closure, face modifications? Because, as I said, the Clive was a salesman, but his salesmanship was but one component of an interlocking machine of persuasion. In the era after my work with the Clive, his gifts to me, his knowledge that he passed on, made it so that as I faced various challenges and layoffs and making new decisions, I was often annoyed, occasionally worried, but I was very rarely surprised. Because one of the basic core tenets of the Clive was to understand that everything changes. Everything can become different in a moment. But if you keep your eyes open, if you keep your ears aware, you can hear phrases and looks and stances that tell you what other choices you might be facing very soon. The worst kind of layoff, the worst kind of job ending is the surprise where you come in ready to do your job and people are standing there and they shake your world upside down. 
leaving you with a few demands, a request to sign something, and a general sense of powerlessness. But because of the Clive, when I was laid off, I knew exactly what was happening. I did it on my terms, and I left them in both cases of being laid off with a completely empty desk, completely devoid of anything of my own, enabling me to walk around, wave goodbye to friends, wish them well, and leave with my hands and my concerns completely free. And the reason I could do that was reading those seismic waves that bounced underneath the office politics to notice when different people were being placed into positions that would affect me, when new names popped up, names that shouldn't have been in my awareness, but for some reason were popping up again and again, shifting their language and timidly trying to find some failure, some weakness, some sort of made-up issue that they could hammer me out of the workforce with. With the invisible advice of the Clive, the stressful part of those experiences wasn't there. And in both cases, I moved on to greener and greener pastures. We don't always know who will be our most influential mentors. It's very rare we don't have somebody that in retrospect we can look back on and see where they intentionally or unintentionally guided us. Maybe they were a negative reinforcement, or maybe they were so inspiring we made changes in ourselves to act like them. It's only with the perspective of time that I look back on the lessons that the Clive taught me. Stay aware. Keep an eye out. Look for change in the wind. Find or make opportunities. And be prepared for a few hard nights, furiously learning what you need to to fulfill the promises made yesterday. And you will find that even in the face of disaster or the heights of success, you will dig out of the side of them incredible opportunity. All hail the Clive. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It. Thanks to James Bekoyanu, Mark Pilgrim, Ernie Hershey, Michael Rubin, Dileep Reddy, Sean Kelly, Trixie the Cat, Martin, Sembiance, Benjamin Guts, and Anonymous, along with the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. Among the work I did for the Clive was registering a domain name for his business which, upon his retirement, he didn't need. But I kept that name. I figured it was worth it to throw a few dollars at it and keep it around because it was a very simple, small word. After about 15 years beyond registering it, I was offered a pretty good chunk of change for that domain name. I sold it and enjoyed a multi-week vacation in Japan a few years before my heart attack. In that way, that small preparatory way, I was able to have a very important life-changing experience taking travel to a place I dreamed about. Based on planning, contingency, maintaining things of value, and the incredible advice of the Clive. <laughs>